necrotizing something. Um, <laughs> <laughs> the necrotizing thing I haven't read. <laughs> Covering the story with due understatement and subtlety, the tabloid newspaper, the Daily Star, had the large headline on its front page, Killer Bug Ate My Face. <laughs> And the Sun, the best-selling newspaper in the UK, screamed, Flesh, it, flesh bug ate my brother in 18 hours. <laughs> and the Daily Mirror, not to be outdone, Flesh-eating bug killed my mother in 20 minutes. <laughs> that's, that's the hyper version of necrotizing... <laughs> the fact that there was nothing new in this bacterium, that while gruesome in its effect, it killed tiny numbers of people each year, particularly when co compared to other bacterial infections such as TB and pneumonia, and that the chances of being infected were infinitesimal, mattered less than that it satisfied a certain kind of news value that is ignorant but loves to wallow in gore, and that readily has the ear of a public which is fascinated by the bizarre, the gruesome, the violent, the inhuman, the fearful. Here was a classic example of bad journalism causing a public panic driven by debased standards of the profession and a profound scientific illiteracy. From a journalistic standpoint, however, the bug, as with HIV, had star quality that was impossible to ignore. The director of the public health laboratory in the UK was forced to declare that, quote, there is no killer bug sweeping the country, end quote. A statement that could only be made if people thought there was a new virulent epidemic that put all at risk. The fact is that there is a political economy of fear, and the media knows it. They know that stories that frighten people are, however perversely, extremely good for circulation and ratings. The dominant cultural apparatus employ fear because fear, like blood, sells. It's something the public understands and seems to need. Fear of the other, I mean, in, our, uh, in, in today's world, think Muslim of, and death panels of, quote, socialism, Marxism, fascism often uttered in the same sentence, suggesting a massive intellectual confusion. Uh, and fear of the bug uh, that is going to decimate humankind. In other words, fear, however perversely, has a crude fiscal utility. It sells. Think of the coverage of SARS, bird flu, piggy flu, <laughs> all of which represented, uh, were, 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 all of which were represented within the narrative of plague. In somewhat different vein, <laughs> think of the wall-to-wall -wall coverage of Balloon Boy. When the media utterly fixated for hours on this strange object, which just might have a small boy on board, who just might plummet to his death live. Fantastic <laughs> television. Fantastic television. It would have... <laughs> I was, I was in the UK when that story was happening, but even they were covering it. Um, it would, however, be wrong to see the problem with the coverage of stories um, such as these and of HIV as only a function of flaws within the profession. What is buried inside the coverage of AIDS are two key elements of our own consciousness. The idea of play I've already spoken of, but there is also the idea of cure. The fear of forces beyond our control alongside the rational optimism which sees in the triumph of science our ability to cure even the most brutal of illnesses. Indeed, so profound is our belief in the cures of science, the secular theology of the 20th and 21st century, with its priesthood of scientists, that we construct any problem, grievance, pain, fear, in conceptual terms, terms that not only allow us to seek the cure, but demand that we do so. And nesting at the heart of this web of moods and desires was that increasingly powerful part of the global economy and certainly the cultures of aid societies, the medical industrial complex, a term coined not by any left radical but by the former editor of the New England Journal of Medicine. The complex has within its gift, as it constantly reminds us, the power to offer hope. But before there can be hope, there must be hopelessness. And the consequence of the coverage by the media of the AIDS crisis was precisely to create that feeling. Mediated language is always inscribed with history, with basic, often hidden assumptions that lurk unquestioned but constrain our ways of seeing just as surely as a potter's hand shapes clay. 
One of the central functions of journalism is to provide a passage to the surface for manifestations of those assumptions. But since journalism in relation to science is a dependent culture, it inevitably provides a conduit for the claims of the medical industrial complex. Those claims constitute a mythos about medical science, central to which is the idea of the cure. The problem of AIDS was conceptualized within that mythos, constructed out of lay and professional understandings of the germ theory of disease. The beauty, and I use that word carefully, the beauty of the HIV hypothesis from a journalistic standpoint was that it comported brilliantly with what we all know, that bugs are beasts and the scientist is the one who can slay them. That is a good story. What I'm suggesting is that there is a very significantly developed tendency of the modern mind to think in terms of the specificity of illness and to reconstitute the essence of a problem to match that expectation. The real problematic nature of the dominant AIDS thesis was not, could not be addressed, not because of scientific reasons, but because of culture, psychology, and historically informed, commonsensical understandings of the nature of illness. In fact, what links the vast bulk of both scientific and social scientific discourse about AIDS is that the basic thesis, the germ theory of AIDS, is assumed to be totally unproblematic. It is, because, it is so because our ways of seeing illness and health and medical science make it difficult for it to be any other way, journalists included. So in proposing a counter thesis, you are not just setting your face against scientific and industrial establishments, you are setting it against deeply ingrained beliefs in the public mind. You are in fact setting it against the very history of the culture. There are other obvious and important reasons why the germ theory of AIDS came to be lodged with such force within scientific and lay discourse. The first and most obvious is that huge amounts of money are tied up within a political economy of AIDS. And the obvious point that corporate and institutional interests, not to mention thousands of careers, are utterly dependent on the continued commitment to the HIV hypothesis and will do everything in their power to sustain it. Seems equally obvious that another reason why the germ theory of AIDS has proven to be so resilient and ideologically beyond challenge is that science always works by constructing paradigms that it then jealously guards, as many in this room know only too well, by declaring the dissenting voice to be the heretical voice in need of punishment and banishment. Not that there's anything new here. During his trial, Galileo wrote to the Grand Duchess Christina in a way which is curious, curiously resonant today. Quote, Some years ago, I discovered in the heavens many things that had not been seen before in our own age. The novelty of these things, as well as some consequences which follow from them in contradiction to the physical notions commonly held amongst academic philosophers, stirred up against me no small number of professors, as if I had placed these things in the sky with my own hands in order to upset nature and overturn the sciences. Showing a greater fondness for their own opinions than for truth, they sought to deny and disprove the new things which, if they had cared to look for themselves, their own senses would have demonstrated to them. There are finally two other thoughts that need to be considered. The mediated articulation of the health risk of HIV infection came to depend not upon relative perceived risks of certain behavioral pathologies, but upon the political necessity to argue that all sexual activity is destructive so that no one particular activity might be accused of being particularly dangerous or at risk lest such arguments sound moralizing. It was vitally important to the emergent gay leadership in the early 1980s that the epidemic not be overly associated with the gay community. I don't blame them. The fact that a virus was being blamed suited them fine since viruses are nothing if not democratic. The journalist and gay activist Randy Schultz observed just before he died, quote, the gay AIDS groups were successful in their propaganda effort, saying that every heterosexual was about to get AIDS, but they weren't, close quote. He was the ideological chaff to confuse the radar of social discourse about a serious issue, and it worked. The countervailing theses which touched on lifestyle were off the agenda. The real tragedy of the deep commitment to the H.